Hello, everyone. I am Mansi Garg, and I manage the project operations here at ACD's Pharma Assay Services Group. I'm joined here today by my colleague and an expert in histopathology, Dr. Farhat Mustafa. First of all, I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during these challenging times. We at Biotechni are monitoring the situation as it evolves. We are considered an essential business and are fully operational and open to helping our collaborators with their immediate service needs. So who are we? Pharma Assay Services or PAS is the only CRO specialized in providing RNA-ish services and can help you visualize and quantify your target gene of interest with morphological context. This webinar will introduce our RNA scope and base scope in situ hybridization services, our capabilities and workflow, especially the use of our quality control tissue bank for target validation. And then Dr. Mustafa will dive into quantitative image analysis capabilities with examples of a few case studies on how our services are contributing to and advancing therapeutic programs of hundreds of pharma and biotech companies worldwide. So getting straight to the question, what is RNA scope and how is it relevant to spatial transcriptomics? Traditional transcriptomic analyses have relied on bulk tissue analysis, such as PCR, which provide an average level of gene expression in a sample, but loses the spatial and single cell information. This is akin to a fruit smoothie, which can be a delicious drink, but you can only guess at what is in the smoothie. The advent of single cell transcriptomic analyses, such as single cell RNA-seq, have now been able to provide molecular information at single cell level, and to come back to the fruit analogy, can now provide you the menu and tell you what fruit and how much of each fruit went into that smoothie. However, these techniques still do not provide you with how those cells are organized in tissue context. And this is where spatial analysis comes into play. Single cell multiplexing spatial analysis that detect RNA can provide transcriptomic information with spatial organization while retaining single cell resolution. So now, instead of an average blended smoothie with mystery ingredients, you can see all the fruit and how it is spatially arranged. The RNA scope technology is an ideal spatial analysis solution to interrogate complex tissues. It's highly specific and sensitive method to detect RNA biomarkers in cells and tissues with morphological context at the single cell level. It consists of three parts. A unique target probe that ACD designs against your sequence of interest, signal amplification system that generates a high signal to noise ratio, and lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules as dots. The assay allows for spatial mapping of micro mRNA, long non-coding RNA, splice variants, and highly homologous sequences in cells and intact tissue, all of which can be visualized with either fluorescent or chromogenic labels. And the assay can be performed on a wide variety of sample types, including FFPE tissues, fresh frozen or fixed frozen tissues, PBMCs, and cultured cells. The growth and adoption of the RNA scope technology is best exemplified by the number of peer reviewed publications. We had our first publication in 2011, and since then, there have been over 2,600 peer reviewed papers published using the RNA scope technology in numerous journals, including many top tier ones. Over 25% of RNA scope papers are published in three big journals, Nature, Science, and Cell. And the RNA scope technology is highly relevant across multiple fields of research, with over 40% of publications in cancer research and neuroscience, followed by infectious diseases, stem cells, inflammation, et cetera. Diving slightly deeper into how the technology works, the first key feature of the RNA scope technology is the probe design. 
we depict the oligonucleotide target specific probes as Zs to emphasize the fact that they have two regions linked by a spacer. The bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript. The top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. When two Zs hybridize in tandem to the target sequence, it creates a unique binding site upon which a preamplifier can bind, and the amplification tree can be built. A standard RNA scope probe for a target sequence of 1,000 bases or more will consist of 20 double Z pairs pooled together and designed to hybridize next to each other along a target region. This allows for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, only a few double Z pairs are needed to bind the target RNA sequence in order to generate enough signal for molecular detection. Here you will find the double Z pair bound to the target sequence. The preamplifier binds to the top of the double Z pairs and to this bind the amplifiers. And each amplifier can further bind multiple labeled probes sequentially hybridizing to assemble a branching complex at each ZZ binding site. Labeled probes can contain a chromogenic enzyme, such as horseradish peroxidase, that generates a visible signal after chromogenic reaction, such as the tab, uh, tab chromogen, detectable under a standard bright field microscope. The labeled probes can also contain fluorophores that allow for visualization of the signal under a fluorescent microscope. This signal amplification strategy allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule. The specificity of our assay relies on this double Z pair. If only one of the Zs would bind to the target sequence, the amplification tree would not be able to form and the single Z molecule would be washed out in one of the stringency wash steps. Here we wanted to share with you what a typical RNA scope experimental configuration looks like. Provided that the target is expressed in the sample and the protocol is followed as recommended, the RNA scope assay is guaranteed. Because tissue samples can be highly variable, proper sample preparation and the right controls are essential to an RNA scope experiment. Tissue samples must be properly fixed and prepared so that there is good quality RNA in the sample and no background due to poor fixation is observed. ACD provides guidelines on how tissues should be fixed for optimal performance of the RNA scope assay. Here are serial sections from human lung cancer sample on which we performed manual red chromogenic assay. On the left is the section stained with our negative control probe, TAP-T, which is a soil bacterium gene that is not expressed in intact tissue. As observed in this sample, there should be no signal from TAP-T. Here in the middle panel is the, a section from the same sample stained with our positive control probe for housekeeping gene PPIB, also known as cyclophilin B. As observed with the sample, you want to see fairly uniform detection with the positive control probe, indicating good quality RNA. Certain tissues may express positive control at higher or lower levels, but in general, you want to see expression throughout the sample. With the results from these two probes, we can have confidence in the test data we see in this rightmost panel. An example, I'm showing you a section from the same lung cancer sample probed for the immune checkpoint marker programmed TEP ligand 1 or PDL1. PDL1 exhibits a wide range of expression in tumor tissues. In this human lung cancer sample, we observe strong punct punctate dots with PDL1 probe, indicating expression of PDL1 in this tumor sample. The control shows us that there is good quality RNA throughout the tissue sample and that there is little to no background. So we can be confident that the localized pattern of expression we observe for PDL1 is in fact the correct result. Scope technology includes two unique assays to detect RNA in the tissue context at single molecule sensitivity 
with single cell resolution. We have RNA scope. For mRNA or non coding RNA greater than 300 nucleotides in length, and base scope for exon junctions, splice variants, and highly homologous or short sequences. As you can see, the RNA scope assay is available chromogenically in two formats, singleplex or duplex, in manual and automated versions. For our fluorescence assay, we have the capability to plex up to four different markers on the same slide. And this can be done either manually or in an automated format. Our base scope assay, used for detection of splice variants or highly homologous sequences, is available in single plex chromogenic format for automated and manual platforms, and in a duplex chromogenic format, only available on manual platform. Here is another great way that we can help further characterize cellular gene expression by combining ISH with IHC on the same slide to simultaneously detect RNA and protein. What we refer to as dual ISH IHC can be used to characterize cell type specific expression, identify origin of secreted proteins, visualize cell surface markers with RNA of interest, visualize RNA binding proteins and their target RNA, and dissect regula regulation of gene expression. Because of similar workflows between ISH and IHC, including sample fixation, pretreatment, probe hybridization, and signal detection, as well as data analysis, the unique benefits of each assay that we have described earlier help us understand that ISH and IHC are ideal to combine into one workflow in which RNA scope ISH assay is performed first, which is then followed up by IHC assay. We do have some recommendations to ensure the success for your dual ish IHC assay. First of all, all dual ish IHC protocols require optimization. In general, it is recommended to combine a working RNA scope protocol with a working IHC protocol. In addition, work with antibodies and a protocol that is known and already established with your tissue samples. Second, it is advisable to perform ish first followed by IHC. Third, it is advisable to optimize IHC assay separately using RNA scope pretreatment reagents to ensure your protein can still be detected following, following RNA scope pretreatment. Lastly, the dual ish IHC assay works better for highly expressed proteins due to protease treatment that is used during the ish protocol. Since we offer this as, an, as a service through our PAS group, you would just leave these optimization and recommendation for our in house experts to establish. Here, I wanted to introduce one of our newest assays to our repertoire, which is the micro RNA scope assay. And what can it help with? It can help with detection of micro RNAs, siRNAs, and ASOs in tissues with spatial and morphological context intact. What you see here on the very top is three samples that have been tested with siRNA one probe. So we have the first sample here in the leftmost panel, which is a saline or negative control. And when tested with the siRNA1 probe, as you can see, we do not see any signal. Here we have the siRNA1 delivered sample, which when tested with the siRNA1 probe shows really strong and punctate dots for the siRNA1. And lastly, we have the third sample in the rightmost panel, which has been delivered with siRNA2, and as we can see, there is no detection with siRNA1 probe, thus indicating the successful delivery of siRNA therapy and specificity of our miRNA scope assay. The key applications, as mentioned earlier, are detection of microRNAs, siRNAs, ASOs, piRNAs, and other short RNA sequences uh, anywhere between 17 to 50 nucleotides. What we combine here is the high sensitivity and high specificity to enable detection of small RNA molecules at single cell resolution with improved detection of target RNA and ease of data analysis. The microRNA scope assay can be applied to FFPE, fixed and frozen uh, tissues, fresh frozen tissues, as well as cultured cells. 
It is available in manual and automated singleplex format for chromogenic visualization and is compatible for ISH and IHC. So this really is fresh off the boat and available only through pharma assay services as of now. Over summer, you will hear from our product teams and this will become available as a commercially available product. Uh, but for now, it's only available through our pharma assay services flow. Next, moving on to what is pharma assay services and how our expert histopathology services can be of use with your research needs. As you will see here, we can help with acquisition of tissue samples through our trusted chain of tissue providers, pre-qualification of these for RNA scope and base scope-ish assays. We also work with third-party CROs and can easily manage the embedding and sectioning of your samples in your studies. We can stain for RNA scope or base scope assays, which are routinely provided through our service panel, provide quantitative assessment, and put all of this together into a report, which includes our findings as well as the materials and methods of the study. To give you a quick overview, we are a group of over 20 experienced lab staff and service 20 of the top 20 pharma assay services, pharma clients. What you see here in the top rightmost panel just shows the bandwidth and the number of slides that we are churning out each year, which is upwards of 15K every year. We have customers in over 20 countries, and we have board certified pathologists here in our team and our CMO who guides all of them and is the CMO not just for ACD, but for biotechnic group of companies. Our team also includes image analysis specialists who can help you uh, understand and assess which fluorophores would be best for your studies need, as well as which acquisition platforms might work best for your studies. The work that we do here helps enable drug discovery, and we are applicable all the way from target discovery into development being used at the target sc screening stage, efficacy stage, DMPK studies and safety and toxicology studies, as well as performing early, act, early feasibility assessment for development in phase one clinical trials. So how can we help with target validation? So here's a quick example of how we can validate candidate targets based on disease and cell type specific expression. So what you see here in the left-hand panel is a normal sample tested for a target gene and a diseased model, which is tested for the same target gene. What we are seeing here is clear-cut expression panel expression for this marker in the diseased, which is not expressed in the normal tissue. And this is extremely quantifiable as well, where we can quantify the expression that is seen based on these brown dots here. And this expression can also be classified into tumor versus stroma. As Farhat will talk more about this in, in, the, in the presentation moving forward, I'm not going to go into too much of details here, but we can see how some markers can, can show up only in the tumor or in the stroma. Moving really quickly into biomarker assay development, we can help evaluate candidate biomarker expression across disease tissues and establish assay performance and dynamic range using bioanalytical method with validation guidelines. What we can help here is with reproducibility assessment, doing precision testing, as well as specificity, sensitivity, repeatability, and stability testing. And all of this with robustness included from the assay. We would like to share with you how you can leverage our pre-qualified normal tissues and tissue microarrays that have been qualified for RNA scope assay for high sensitivity screening of your targets for preclinical ADME and safety assessment. We have these normal tissue microarrays already available in our bank and would just need to use your target marker and run it across this to see in which samples we see higher or lower expressions. As mentioned earlier, PAS has been routinely involved in early feasibility studies and assay development. We have a procedure that begins with assay prototype establishment, followed by precision and reproducibility testing. 
Once the images have been acquired and based on discussions with the sponsor, we establish a pathologist guided scoring criteria. All the findings in the method development are documented and shared as a written SOP or study report, which includes optimized assay conditions. In conjunction with our FAS team, the assay is then transferred to a recommended clear site where we help their team establish or run the RNA scope assay on their instruments and follow it up with cross method validation to ensure the results across site have good concordance. Here are two examples of the use of RNA scope assay as companion diagnostic in clinical trials. The first one was with Merrimack and use of RNA scope for patient selection based on heregulin positivity. The second collaboration where RNA scope was utilized as a companion diagnostic was with Bayer in Germany and used for early screening for patient specific tumor markers in different cancer types. Now we would move into the capabilities and workflow from the Pharma Assay Services Group. Projects through Pharma Assay Services can be designed a la carte to help with overflow needs at any step, that is staining only or analysis only, or whichever place you might need help from us. Ancillary offerings include H&E staining, FFPE sectioning, and helping to source tissues, which can be one of the most difficult aspects for the researchers. Just to show you a little bit about our bandwidth, on site we have here 16 Leica and Ventana auto stainers, three Aperio 82 state of the art bright field scanners, a Zeiss fluorescent scanner, two 3D Histec panoramic scanners, and six Halo workstations, which help enable a very high throughput of 10,000 plus to 15,000 plus slides delivered per year. Really quickly, just giving you a little bit of a highlight about what we have in our pre-qualified tissue bank. These pre-validated tissues in our tissue bank ensure high quality samples and a faster turnaround with guaranteed RNA integrity. ACD can help source tissues without the need for setting up third-party vendors for purchasing. And we can also help with new sample collection. ACD will coordinate with embedding, C embedding CROs to ensure samples are prepared according to guidelines for RNA preservation. Thus eliminating risk, shortening the turnaround time and reducing cost for you. I also wanted to provide you with just a quick highlight into our QC services. We can help maximize the number of samples that pass QC by entrusting the RNA scope experts to run these QC and optimization steps, which will then help free up your instruments for other projects. We can receive QC samples here. And, and what we would provide back to you, excuse me, would be the QC samples with optimized conditions and the h &E stains. As you can see from the very bottom panel over here, when tested with standard pretreatment conditions, a sample might lose the morphological context or as, or as you can see in this case, the, the nuclear boundaries. But when, when performing optimized pretreatment, you can see that the nuclear boundaries are extremely clear and can, much, and can help improve the cell uh, identification during quantitative analysis quite a lot. We also wanted to share with you something about how we manage quality systems and security for the data generated through PAS. SOPs govern the PAS workflow, including staining procedures, sample tracking, data management, and data QC. Each and every run that is performed on our instruments, whether manual or automated, includes a HeLa cell technical control. And these HeLa run suitability criteria are run with positive and negative controls for each and every assay with strict requirements and QC criteria, and any run that fails the requirements would need to be repeated. The data that we generate here is shared through a secure enterprise file sharing system called Ignite, 
and we have restricted access to data and know exactly who will be uh, able to access it from the teams here. We have an electronic data management system here as well to help enable the management. Lastly, what are the deliverables that we would be sending back to your team once the project has been completed? We would and remaining unused material. You would also receive a summary of the scoring results and to show our TMA heat maps can be generated as needed. We would wrap all of this data up into a project report or a study brief and share that with you. This report would include representative images of ish staining and if included, halo image masks. We would share all of the images that are generated, the 40x whole slide scans and the imaging software for viewing it. And this data can be presented by our scientific team via teleconference and have further follow-up discussions as well. The PAS workflow includes multiple rounds of optimization to be performed until the best signal-to-noise ratio has been determined. Internal controls provide confidence that maximum sensitivity is achieved. We then move, once we have established these pretreatment conditions, we move into the phase two or marker staining phase where the target is run with the same pretreatment conditions as established in phase one. And all of this is governed by quality processes and SOPs, which ensure reliability and confidence in the data. Following that, we perform data analysis. And with this, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Mustafa, who will walk you through our data analysis methodologies and associated case studies. Everybody is safe and healthy, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Dr. Farhad Mustafa, and I'll walk you through some of the methodologies that we usually perform for the quantitation, a quantification of the data that we see on our images. So the most commonly used scoring system that we use for our, most of our projects is the semi-con visual scoring. This is performed by our highly trained experts and it's a rapid scoring system which shortens the turnaround time and speeds the delivery of our results. So we, pro we provide you two things, the expression level and the percentage of positive cells. If you can see this slide, you see these cells and you can see with, uh, as we move from left to right, the number of dots per cell increases. So the cells with no signal are scored as zero and the cells with a very high signal of more than 15 dots per cell are scored as four. Going on to the next slide. So you, we usually perform the single plex visual scoring system. And if you have a single plex essay, as you can see in this image, we have just the red dots here, which we can see in this image. If we have to score them, we, we, we score them on the basis of number of dots per cell and the average number of dots and the predominant pattern that we see in the whole tissue is the score that is assigned to this sample. In addition to that, we also have to assess the percentage of cells that are positive for these, uh, the signal. So the percentage of cell will also include the cells which have any cell that has at least one dot per, new, per cell is included in the uh, positive percentage of cells. So this single plex visual scoring, this can be done for the whole tissue. And if you have any region of interest, sorry, if you have a region of interest of, or we have any specific cell types that we need to score separately from this tissue, we can do the scoring for those cells as well. So for example, if we need to score a tumor versus the stroma, we can have separate semicon scores for each of these. And sometimes we have different regions in a tissue, like we have the epidermis and germis, and we need to score them separately we can have separate scores for them. And sometimes we have a specific cell type and we only want to see the scores in those cell types. So in short, we can change, we can use this scoring system as per our needs. So the next slide is for the duplex visual scoring. So if you see this image, you can see there are two types of stains, the green and the red. So if we have to quantify these signals, it is the same as we do for the single plex studies. So you have the score and you have the percentage of positive cells for each of these markers. So this duplex visual scoring, it also provides you the cells which show co-expression for both these markers. The most important thing to be considered here is the denominator for scoring, for calculating the uh, cells which show co-expression. So like you can see in this slide, so you have cells which have expression for marker A and marker B, these can be calculated from the total number of cells, or we can have cells showing 
positivity for both these markers and the denominator can, denominator can be cells which are positive for marker A. Similarly, we can change the denominator to cells which are positive for signal B. So as you can see in this, uh, uh, in this image, not all cells show positivity for both markers, but sometimes it's important also to see histologically if there are certain regions which are showing these dual positivities or if there are any certain cells which can be identified morphologically and those are the cells that, that are showing positivity. So uh, this, uh, whenever we are doing the scoring, it's important to mention here that we also see, we also make note of any other observations that we see. So if we are seeing anything specific, if we are seeing the cell population which is showing dual positivity, which may be different from the other cells, we do mention that in our additional notes. And our team of scientists, it's, uh, they, are, they are trained to make such observations. Moving on to the next slide. So the next method of scoring is the edge scoring. It's important that this uh, edge scoring, it is only performed by the pathologist. And what we do in this edge scoring is the cells are grouped into pins, depending on the number of dots in each cell. So if you see this image, we have a heterogeneous pattern of expression. Some of the cells are showing single dots, some cells do not show any expression, and then there are some cells which show very high expression. Each of these cells, they are, they are binned into categories. So if you see, if there's an edge score panel if you, on your right side, and you can see there are cells, around 8% of cells do not show any signal. At the same time, the maximum signal is seen in pin one and two. So why is this edge score important? So even though if we have to, if we have to quantify it using the semicon scoring, the score would be somewhere between one to two. But with edge score, we don't lose the sight of the cells which are in pin three and pin four. And again, like for the semicon scoring, the edge scoring can, so, can also be performed either for the whole tissue or for your region of interest, like uh, the tumor versus the stroma. And sometimes we can subdivide these regions into immune component, the stromal component from, uh, comprising of the mesenchymal cells, and the immune component within the tumor. So it can be tailor-made according to your needs. So, uh, and the, the, the another important point about edge scoring, it, it ranges from zero to 400, but then uh, if we have to compare our edge scores with the IHC scores, we, we can club together bin three and bin four, and then we can calculate our edge scores from zero to 300 for direct comparison with the IHC edge scores. Moving on, the, the, the methodologies that we discussed so far, they are all done manually and visually. So the next methodology is the dig digital image analysis. analysis. So for digital image analysis, we use the HALO software from the Indica Labs. It is done by our team of highly qualified image analyst scientists. With HALO analysis, we provide the expression data on a cell-by-cell -cell basis across the entire tissue section. It, again, it can be done on the entire tissue section or defined areas of interest. Halo analysis, it requires high quality images. And for that, we are using state-of-art slide scanners to ensure optimal image quality and a good signal-to-noise ratio. After the images are acquired, the next step in halo analysis is identifying the region of interest, which is the most important step, and which is done by, by our halo experts in consultation with the pathologist. Once we do the annotations, as you can see in the second image, once we do the annotations, our HALO experts adjust the settings to detect the cells and the edge signal with high level of accuracy. After the data is generated, it goes through a second round of QC before it is finalized. In addition to the spreadsheet data that we provide, we also provide the graphs for easy interpretation, as you can see in this image. HALO, while being automated, needs our expert scientists' input for nuclear outline detection, followed by optimal cell segmentation, plugged with appropriate ish dot identification. With years of experience in having helped build beta tests, some of the modules for ish identification, our image analysis experts already have a pre identified setting to give them a head start. So you can see in this image that we have to identify the nuclear outline, we have to see the cell segmentation and the H dot identification. So it's very important that we do not under detect or over detect any of these parameters. For nuclear outline detection, we use the co color deconvolution for cell segmentation. Again, the, the nucleus is uh, considered as a landmark for drawing the perimeter around the cell. For H dot identification, we again, if you have a, if you have the signal in the form of clumps, it's able to 
segment that signal into individual dots. So with halo image analysis, you can get the exact number of dots in each cell. And it's not just the uh, categorization into bin four or five. You can also you can also have the exact number of dots. For example, a cell has 28 dots in it and it will be categorized as score four. But at the same time, maybe you lose that information of 28 dots. With halo analysis, you have that information as well. So going on to the next slide. This is how the halo analysis looks like. The image on the right is what we, we already um, shared with you for the uh, pathologist X and score. So if we do halo analysis on the similar same image, then you can see, you can easily identify these cells with, they are demarcated and you can see the nuclear outlines, you can see the cytoplasmic outlines, and you can see various shades of red. So what do these shades indicate? So as the intensity of the color increases, it means greater number of dots in that particular cell. So that kind of gives you a visual interpretation of what the signal looks like. Then again, the output data is in the form of edge score, like we have seen in the, like we saw with the pathologist edge score, we have built these cells into different categories from bin zero to bin four, depending on the number of dots they have. And then using a weighted formula, we can score, we can calculate the edge score. So the total edge score also gives you an, uh, information about the total expression pattern in a, in a tissue or a sample. But if you if you uh, if you look at if you break it down to individual scores, you can also get an information about what the what what is the percentage of cells in each category. So this is the information. This is an additional information that you see in edge score and which is not seen in the semi-con scoring system. Okay. So like we uh, like Marcy said before, so there is always a pathologist review at the beginning at, and at the end of the halo analysis. It's important that we identify the regions of interest uh, correctly. Uh, like in this image, you can see there's a tumor component, there's a stromal component, and there's an additional uh, normal surrounding tissue. So it is important to identify each of these correctly. So the, uh, the halo specialist sits with the pathologist and we annotate these images to identify correctly each of these regions. If, if you see in the first image, it's just the tumor com uh, compartment. It is outlined in red. In the next, we have both these compartments together, the tumor as well as the tumor-associated stroma. And in the third image, it's just the stroma that has been uh, outlined in black. Moving on. Uh, Farad, I'm sorry to interrupt, but really quickly, we just wanted to make a note that we really appreciate everybody listening in. If you have any questions, please enter into the Q&A box and just please give us a few minutes and we'll try and get back to your questions right away through our panelists. Sorry, Farad. Uh, so we have now a brief overview of the methodologies and uh, Mansi gave you a uh, broader perspective about how the RNA scope works. Now, I will be discussing in detail some of the case studies where we can see the practical application of RNA scope technology. So the case study one, it was a study which was done with Insight and it was presented by Insight at 2018 ESCO SITC. To give you some background, IDO1 is essential to the primary and rate limiting step in tryptophan catabolism to generate time. So why is it important is because if there's a decrease of local tryptophan or there's an increase of kind, it can result in suppression of anti-tumor immune responses. So you can see on your screen, there's a panel of HeLa cells. So these HeLa cells were stimulated with interferon gamma at varying con concentrations of, for 18 hours. And they were assayed for IDO1 expression. And they used three types of technologies. This expression was assayed using RNA scope ish IHC and Western block. So you can see all these, uh, the results of all the three assays on your screen. So while it can be readily observed based on the images shown here that the antibody for IDO1 was not as sensitive as RNA-ish, the con quantitative comparison of three platforms demonstrated that IHC was around 10 times less sensitive than RNA scope and Western plot analysis. Now, to see whether these were coordinated, whether the protein expression and the mRNA were coordinated, we have we compared the IHC with the Western plot. And we have, as you can see in this graph, there is a high degree of correlation with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, suggesting that this was highly, the uh, induction was highly coordinated. 
both at the mRNA levels and the protein levels. The next step for this study was the comparison of IDO1 IHC and ISH using antibody and RNA scope ISH in the melanoma samples. So this is important. So what we are, we are seeing here are two images of the tumor tissues. One is stained with uh, RNA scope. The other one on the right side is with IHC. So a, a scoring method was developed to classify IDO1 expression in tumor cells, in immune cells, which were infiltrating the tumor and the immune cells, which were seen in the peritumoral area. An H score of five or greater was, was used as a cutoff for IDO1 positive. As seen previously, this quantitative approach confirmed that the sensitivity with RNA scope was much higher as compared to IHC. If you look at this table, you can see that the, if the percentage of positive cells in tumor region in ish versus the IHC, it was almost double in ish, whereas it was just 24 percent with the IHC. In the in the intratumoral region, the level of positivity was comparable. So why is it important? So because the threshold is five and the RNA scope is more sensitive. So that means that we can include more cases that they can be candidates for IDO1 inhibitor therapy if we use the uh, ish technology as compared to the IHC where we may, because of the less sensitivity, we may lose certain cases because they will not be those, those cases where the IDO1 uh, uh, marker is at low levels. So moving on to the case study number two, this was one of the immuno-oncology studies, and this was done to interrogate the co-expression patterns of various checkpoint targets in the uh, tumor microenvironment. And for that, we first generated tumor microarrays from lung cancer patients, as you can see in your first, towards the left-hand side, these blocks. So we had around 60 non-small cell lung carcinoma tissue blocks, and the first step was to check them for the RNA integrity and quality using PPIB as positive control and DAP as negative control. So out of these tissue blocks, 60 tissue blocks, we uh, 54 passed our QC process and these were used to generate the TMA. You can see these two slides, the tissues were arranged in these two, on these two tissue slides and the tumor is represented by the yellow cores and four uh, normal adjacent tissues were also included as a control uh, tissue and they can be seen as white dots on these slides. So what we did, the next step was to do a single plex assay to see the expression of various markers, followed by duplex and multiplex assay where we wanted to see the co-expression. So you can see here the expression of PDL1. So we have just uh, there are these four cores. They show the variation in expression of PDL1. If you see the core 2B2, the expression is quite high. The tumor cells are showing a score of around 3. And uh, But it, it's important to mention here that the quantification was done using halo analysis. So that's why you have these H scores. For this first score, the expression was high. And as we move on, the sex, second core is showing a slightly intermediate uh, expression. And the cores at the bottom are showing a low expression with a negligible expression in the fourth core. So what does this actually mean? This means that we have a variety of tumors which can be grouped under non-small cell carcinoma lung. And so these tumors show difference in expression of PDL1. So not all tumors behave similarly, we know that. And this is this can be shown when we see these expression for these markers is variation. And this is what we wanted to show here. Moving on, if we look more closely, so what is the expression within each tumor core uniform? No, the answer is no. So if you look at this core, even though this, they, this, may, this may have a very high edge score, but there are st still certain percentage of cells which, were, which are not showing high, high expression. So which can translate into maybe that there are multiple clonal populations of tumor cells and some are showing very high expression, some are showing intermediate and some are low. So this information is lost if we do not have the edge scores. So once you have the edge scores, you can see the percentage of cells in each category, as you can see it here. So the overall expression, although high, uh, although we can see the edge scores are high, we are not missing the information that there are still some cells which are showing low and intermediate uh, expression. Moving on. So moving on, like I said, after the single plex uh, assay, we did the duplex and the multiplex assay. So what we did was we combined the PDL1 with 
with a range of markers. So you see these images, and I, I'll show you how uh, how a wide range of information can be can be taken from these images. So the first image, if you look at this, so we combine PDL1 with PD1. So what do you see here? So we see that PD, PDL1 is in teal and PD1 is in red. So PD1 is seen mostly in the stromal tissue, but at the same time, if you look more closely, you can see some of the tumor cells are also showing the PD1 expression. So that means there is some co-expression in the tumor cells, whereas PD1 is also, also seen in the stromal cells. Coming to the next image, so PDL1 was combined with PDL2. What, what happens here is that you see the expression is mostly in the tumor cells, and most of the cells are showing co-expression for both PDL1 and PDL2. Now, if you see the third image, this is a totally different situation here. So you see PDL1 was combined with CTLA4. Excuse me. So if you see CTLA4, very high expression, predominantly in the stroma. We don't see any expression in the tumor cells. And see, the, the, so we have so far seen three patterns of expression, co-expression. And if you go to the fourth image, again, PDL1 combined with LAG3. So what do we say here? We see that although predominantly in the stromal tissue, some of the tumor cells are also showing co-expression with LAG3. Then we combine PDL1 with TIN3. You can see very high expression and very high expression both in stroma, in tumors, and there is co-expression. Coming to the last image, PDL1 combined with 4R1BB. Again, few cells are showing expression, not as the frequency is not as high what we saw in our previous images, and some of the tumor cells are showing co-expression. So now, why is this important? We are seeing different levels of co-expression. The best way to quantify these co-expression is using a halo analysis. So you know most of these uh, markers are showing co-expression. So how to uh, compare them? So the, uh, only when we have the exact percentage of cells that are showing co-expression and we have the exact marker expression, we will be able to quantify this and compare the expression for combination of these markers. Moving on. So why is co-expression important in this study? So, co so if, if you see here, we are uh, showing the expression for PD1 and TIN3 in single cells. This co-expression, it helps in the understanding the potential resistance mechanism of checkpoint inhibitors, as well as it brings an insight into combinatorial therapies. So like you see in this uh, example, it shows single cell co-expression of TIN3 and PD1. As you know, PD1 is in, three, in green and TIN3 is in red. Moving on, so it's, uh, this slide is to show you why it is important to identify the correct regions of interest for any kind of analysis. So if you see the images on the left hand side, this is the right field image and then we have the uh, image from the halo analysis. Again, like I said, increase in the intensity of green indicates increase in the ex marker expression. So what we did is that in, we compared the expression of LAG3 and PDL1 in stromal region, tumor region, and the whole core. So if you look at these graphs, what you see is that LAG3, it's very high in the stromal region as compared to the tumor region, whereas reverse is true for PDL1. PDL1 is high in tumor region and it's low in the stromal region. But this information is totally lost when we look at the whole core. We do not get this information that there are markers which are higher in the tumor and there are markers which are higher in the stroma. So it is important to choose the right kind of analysis and the right regions of interest to get the relevant information. So like Mansi mentioned, we also provide heat maps with our halo analysis. If you look at this heat map, it is uh, these different colors, they represent the target marker expression. So red means a higher expression and Green means low, with yellow is somewhere in between. So if you look at this, this heat map, this, is, this organizes these uh, cores and these markers. So if you look at a particular core, you can get a very quick information about the type of expression it has for various markers. So if you look at the first column, you can see this core has, most of the markers are showing very high expression. Then similarly towards the end, the green ones is when we have the low expression. So, there's a, there's a lot of information in these heat maps, and it's very easy visually to see which cores are showing what kind of an expression. Coming to the third study, that is the CAR T infiltration study. 
The study was actually done with Bellicum, um, and it was done in two phases. In the first phase, we had 10 samples, five pre-treatment and five post-treatment samples. These samples, they were evaluated for the presence of CD3 positive cells using IHC and CAR signal using ISH. As expected, the pre-treatment samples were negative for CAR signal, and three out of five post-treatment samples were positive for CAR signal. So this was followed by more in-depth qualitative assessment to understand the distribution of these cells. It was observed that these cells were distributed in the tumor, in the stroma, and in the surrounding normal tissue, wherever it was present. Then we followed it by the second step was the quantification of these signals using halo analysis. If you look at these images, these are those positive samples. The, one, the first one is from the lymph node, the second is the liver, third is the omentum. The highest signal was seen in the omentum. And the distribution, if you see for, if you, if you look at this uh, graph in the middle, you can see the distribution of these cells. Uh, so you can see stroma, tumor, stroma, and adjacent normal cells. So why this was important is that we, while we were able to identify the CD3 cells with the CAR signals, this cannot be done using just the IHC. And here, we, we, uh, the, uh, the first phase used just the qualitative assessment. We were just telling them whether the signal is present or not. So this kind of uh, decreases the workload. So you do, you're not uh, analyzing all the samples for, you're not doing the halo analysis on all the samples. You're only doing the halo, halo analysis on the relevant sample. So sometimes it's important to just do the qualitative assessment before you uh, select your samples for the next level of analysis. So, just to give a little bit of background, we all know that these CAR T cells target surface antigens and the TCRs target the intracellular mo uh, molecules. And RNA scope is equally relevant as we have seen. Since both are comprised of portions of various human proteins, there is no way to distinguish them from the endogenous proteins using the antibodies. So RNA, techno RNA scope technology, it will enable the visualization of CAR T or TCR cell distribution in tumor microenvironment. Like I said, we were able to see them everywhere, tumor, stroma, and the normal tissue. And the most important thing is that you can also include a cross-chaining with a marker of activation, like the gram enzyme B or interferon gamma, and that will give you an assessment about the activation state of these cells. So, uh, so co-staining with the cell type marker, it, it will tell you about the functionality and also help you in monitoring the anti-tumor activity of these cells. Moving on, we had another similar study for the CAR T cell infiltration, and to give you a little bit of background, this was done by Adapt Immune, and it was published in ASCO SITC 2018. So, this was a TCR T cell therapy, uh, and it was a patient clinical trial. It was conducted by Adapt Immune and later transferred to GSK. So, what was the background? So, there's a protein NYESO1 with an immunogenic tumor antigen which is expressed in patients who are with multiple myelomas, those patients which have poor prognosis, kind of an uh, indicator of poor, poor prognosis. So, the Adapt Immune, they developed a gene modified autologous tumor reactive TCR against this peptide, and it's called as the SPARE. Using the RNA scope to understand, they use the RNA scope to understand the mechanism of response and the resistance to PCR T cells. They were also able to look for the functionality of the PCR cells post infusion They performed the ISH on FFP tumor biopsies prior to and following the adoptive T cell transfer. It was done on the synovial sarcoma patients. And what we saw was that if you look at this image, you can see uh, there are cells showing red as well as green uh, staining. So the red is for the TCR and the green is for the CD3 positive cells. So the cells which have red staining, they have a background of CD3 positivity, but because the expression is very high, it is getting a little masked. But in addition to that, you are also seeing the cells which just have the green staining, which means these are CD3 cells and they're not engineered cells. So what they found, what Adapt Immune found was that in addition to these TCR cells, there was infiltration concurrent CD3 cell recruitment into these tissues. So this was an additional finding. They were only looking to maybe looking for this TCR cell component, but they were also able to identify the CD3 cell recruitment. So these tumors with poor T cell lymphocyte infiltration known to be resistant to checkpoint blockage, they appear to be responsive to spare T cell immunity. So the last case study is the base code duplex for CRISPR mediated gene deletion. It's, it's, in, it's in news every time we are hearing a lot about the CRISPR gene. So what we did was 
you look at the image, the base scope duplex assay was it was done to detect the cell specific Cas9 guide RNA in tissues as well as to detect the CRISPR edited transcripts in the same tissues. So CRISPR Cas9 was used to delete 49 nucleotides X, as you can see in this image, resulting in a novel junction sequence labeled as edited. You can see this edited. And then base scope paired oligo 1ZZ probes were designed to target either the 49 nucleotides in the WT sequence or the edited novel junction sequence. So this becomes more clear once we look at the images. So you have the non-edited liver and the edited liver. So you can see the WT probe is only detected in the is detected in the non-edited liver, and we do not see anything, any edited probe in the non-edited liver. So WT, so the green signal means that, okay, so you, if, you, if you look at this uh, image more clearly, it's just the hepatocytes which are showing this expression. For the and in the edited liver, we have three types of cells. The cells which are showing expression for WT, the cells which are showing expression for the edited gene, and the cells which are showing expression for both. So this kind of tells you that there are three types, three populations of cells. So from one image, you can get a lot of information. Again, and it is specific to these hepatocytes. The signal is specific to these hepatocytes. These are the images which are showing a lot of cells, the hepatocytes in the other cell types. Moving on, let's go to the next slide. So to understand whether these signals were specific to hepatocytes and they were not uh, non-specific and expressed in other cell types, we looked at the portal veins, the endothelial cells of the portal veins and the epithelial cells of the pyrex. And what we saw was that for in both non-edited as well as edited livers, we did not see any signal in any of these cells. Same was true for the central veins. What does this mean? This means that these cells are, these, these signals are very specific and this methodology can be applied to different gene editing de detection studies and it can help us visualize biodistribution of edited versus the non-edited cells as well. Okay, so now we are sharing some of the nice comments that we have got from our very valuable customers regarding the STEM experiences, the images, the data, and we are happy to share with all of you. And before that, I will pass it on to Mansi. Over to you, Mansi. Thank you so much, Farhat. And just to close it out and summarize really quickly, um, I would like to add that we provide scientific pre-sales guidance to help you plan your study and with one-on-one -on -one teleconferences, which will help us understand your goals. And our scientists are always available to present the summary data via WebEx to key stakeholders at your end. And we ha always have a project manager associated with the study to ensure timely delivery of your study and, and make sure that the objectives of the study were met. With this, we'll come towards the close of our webinar today. And we will continue to be online for just a few more minutes. Uh, please feel free to send in any questions to our panelists who are waiting to answer them. And hopefully you've been getting your answers back as well. And please stay tuned for the FAQs. So here are some of the frequently asked questions that we've come across. Uh, the first one here relating to what kind of tissues RNA scope and base scope assays are compatible with. Both of our assays are compatible with FFPE samples. They're compatible with fresh frozen or fixed frozen and cultured cells. We support both of these assays on automated and manual platforms. One of the other questions that we also came across was, uh, I do not see signal in my positive control PPIB probe. So this could potentially happen because of compromised RNA quality. RNA might have been degraded, and this, this could be a function of the sample preparation and um, non-optimal non treatment. So what we can do from our end here uh, is we can provide with guidelines for optimal sample preparation and ensure study success. There's a few more questions that we would like to share with you that have come up over the course of time. Um, some along timeline predictions. So a study that is about 20 tissue samples, 25 tissue samples uh, with a couple of markers. Here is what our timelines would look like. Um, they would be around three and a half to four weeks of a timeline for the full project. 
and this would include the first week and a half would probably be in uh, into RNA integrity check and to make sure that we have the right treatment conditions optimized for the marker testing. The marker evaluation usually is the fast part where we can do it in about a week or so uh, for this bandwidth of project. And then the scoring and reporting would be another week and a half, quite a bit of the time actually going in QC aspect of the data that we have generated here. 